I'd like to welcome you to this time of worship at home. You're also welcome to join us at 10 a.m. on Sundays for worship in person. We'd love to meet you here. Whether you're new or returning, I'd ask you to contact ainsworthfree.org and our contact page. Just let us know that you're here. Let us know how we can pray for you or serve you during this time in your life. We're continuing in Ephesians 6, how to stand in Christ. And maybe you've experienced a crisis in your faith, a time when faith was confusing, or maybe you have no faith. Well, this is about the resources that you need for a broken world. And the fourth piece of armor is faith. It's like a shield. Ephesians 6 gives us important insight into spiritual life and how to protect you in the time of crisis and how to send you on the mission of Christ's church. Well, no matter where you are in your faith, this passage of scripture, this time of worship is for you. And we're glad that you joined us today. Good morning, church family. It's good to see all of you online this morning. I would like to direct your attention, if I could, to our prayer emphasis verse this week. It's found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. And it says, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. So we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Such a special verse. God is love. Uh, we're so thankful that God showed his love for us. But we're especially thankful on this Mother's Day weekend for the love that mothers share for their family. We know that the mother is such a vital part to the family unit. But a mother's love can be showed because God first showed us love. And we can see that love through the love of our mothers. So give your mom a hug. Enjoy her and thank her if you can. And enjoy your weekend. Enjoy spring. And enjoy the love that God has for us. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for love. We thank you for truth. We thank you for sending your Son as a sacrifice the greatest picture of love that we that you could show, Father. Lord, Lord, I just again thank you that we can enjoy the benefits, Father, of the sacrifice that you made for us. I thank you for mothers. I thank you for sacrificial love that mothers show every day to children old and young alike. Lord, I just again thank you for what they mean to our lives. I thank you for what they, the direction that they send us, Father, by the love that they show for us. Lord, be with our church family, be with those that are hurting, guide and direct those that have got decisions ahead of them. God, we think of our graduates, we think of uh, the young people that are going different directions this summer. Guide and direct them, Father, as they are heading off to new adventures, Lord. I just pray that they will be thoughtful and mindful of the love that you have for them. And Lord, may they um, share that love with those that they encounter. God, I thank you again for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for a search committee process. I thank you, Lord, for the pastor that you have out there. Lord, open our minds and our thoughts and direct our hearts to the man that you would have for that position. We thank you again for spring. We thank you again for new life. We thank you, Lord, for forgiveness of sins. God, thank you for wiping our slate clean. Lord, we thank you again. We love you and we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. In all the heavens there is one Who conquered death alone and brought our freedom your throne will last throughout all time. Let all the nations bow and bring you praise. Victorious, you reign victorious over sin, over death, over all, over us. A blessed 
Before we talk about faith and the context of standing in Christ in our series in Ephesians 6, I want to ask you to think about when faith matters most in your life. Last week, my wife and I visited her aunt, surprised her for her 85th birthday. She's still very active and has the support of and love and support of many family and friends who live in the area. While we were there, we visited the cemetery. And we talked a lot during our time about Uncle Melvin, even though he had passed away almost nine years ago. And while we were with her, we got a text from friends in Iowa who just had a 28-year-old son who died suddenly. And even though our friend is a good writer, he wrote along with the obituary and posted, I really have no words to describe this adequately. Well, from hearing the stories of people in our church, from hearing what's gone on in your life, we know that there are many who've lost a spouse, a loved one, even a child. You know that there is some pain for which you have no words, and there's no time limit for how long grieving takes. There's a deep pain that begins, as some of you know, that you can't anticipate. No one can truly tell you ahead of time. No one can fully understand how you feel or tell you how long it will last. Well, for most people, this pain becomes less intense over time. But for many, I'd say for most, it never fully goes away. Years may go by. A wave of sadness may hit you suddenly. 
And it's at these times of grief and loss when faith matters the most. And these times will come. At one time or another, sooner or later in your life, because this world is broken and death will affect all of you, even if you can't fully prepare, how do you survive? These are the times when faith matters the most. So why talk about faith on Mother's Day? Well, in what I hope will become obvious in this study of spiritual armor, faith and every part of the armor is important for everyone. But I have a few reasons why I'm talking about this on Mother's Day. First one is rather simple. It's just how the schedule worked out. This faith is for everyone, but it particularly applies, I believe, on this day for a second reason. For some reason, Mother's Day is a difficult day. It's a reminder of pain and loss, maybe lost hope and things that have gone wrong. And so Mother's Day for many people, maybe those who hope to become a mother and it hasn't worked out, Mother's Day can be a difficult day, a day when faith matters the most. The third reason is this, faith is like an armor, faith like an armor is important to honor your mother. Let me explain what I mean by that. How many of you have or had a mother? Well, that was just a reality check. If you'll allow me to generalize for just a moment, men tend to have different ways to compartmentalize pain and loss. And whether those are healthy or unhealthy, I won't comment on all of them, but fathers, men tend to pour themselves into their work or focus on other things that they can fix. And sometimes that's a good thing but sometimes it makes it more difficult. And working to grieve or connect with other people's emotion, either for their self or for others, is only done if it's very intentional. In general, mothers and women more naturally or maybe more willingly accept grief and connect with the emotions of other people. Well, this is not always true for everyone, but to the extent that it is, it's probably not even meant to be as far as we often take it, but it tends to be this way. So as you become more sensitive to grief and loss and pain, you can also be more sensitive to others in tragedy and loss and relieve some of the burden that I, don't, I believe is not meant to all be on your wife or your mother. So here is where faith is critically important and vitally important to make you effective in life and ministry. This growth in faith is for everyone. So here's what I pray that all of us will see and embrace today. Faith shields you when it's rooted, built up, and strengthened in Christ. You see, in a spiritual battle, faith helps you to stand in Christ. And before we review the first three parts of the armor we've talked about the last three weeks, Verse 16 introduces a fourth part of spiritual armor, and it's described as the shield of faith. And verse 16 begins with a phrase, now take up. Distinguishing it from the first three parts of armor, we'll go back to verse 10 as the context of this passage, and notice the shift in the context in these parts of armor from the first three that have been taken up to those now next who must continually be taken up, regularly, intentionally, understood and embraced for faith to shield you in your life and in your ministry. I'll ask you to read along in Ephesians chapter 6 if you'll turn to your Bibles or open them up on your devices. Follow along as we go through this passage together. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, 
with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, verse 16, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. May God bless the reading and the obedience to his word. So far, we've looked at the passage in the first three parts of the armor, spoken in the simple past, having put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and the sandals of peace. And now this shift to take up. So why is this shield, this shield of faith, important? Years ago, my daughters got me a DVD history of World War I. I'm the only one who will watch it. But World War I is very sad at many levels. For one, no one had been at war for many years. We were overly optimistic going into it and certainly unprepared. Another reason, part of that lack of preparation, is that in prior wars there had been horses and swords. Well, the invention of machine guns quickly dispensed with that. Third reason is that the result of all this was that the battle ended up being fought from trenches, shooting back and forth, moving a few yards one way and then the other. No one could figure out how to stage an offensive effectively because out of, being out in the open was too costly. The lesson was simply this. Don't run out in the open without a shield. Don't run out in the open without a shield that's adequate for the attack that's coming to you. Well, in the first century, flaming arrows were used to start a fire at its destination. That would multiply the attack, not only hitting one person with an arrow, but shooting it over to hit a building or something else would start a fire, and then they'd be essentially attacked from within. Here, God gives you a shield. Now, there are two kinds of shields in the first century a soldier might have. One is the small round one, which we are more familiar with probably, used to block swords in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The second one is the more likely one, I believe in this context, is a wood shield that was about two feet wide and four feet long. It was covered with linen and leather made wet so that you could get behind this shield and cover part of the person to the left of you using your sword or spear with your right hand. And therefore, the shield would protect and possibly extinguish the arrows coming to you. This is the picture of walking with Christ and with others. It's a shield made of faith. So what does it mean to live by faith? In the Bible, God is your shield. God is your refuge. When you flee to him and stay behind him, he is your refuge. To walk by faith, then, is to put your trust in the one who protects you. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. See, the, the word faith here replies to trust and reliability and confidence. Here to rely on something, or better stated, someone who is reliable. So to say, I have faith in God, is to say God is trustworthy, so I'm trusting in Him. Maybe like a chair that you're sitting on right now. You sit on it, you probably never gave thought to whether it would be faithful or reliable or trustworthy and hold you up. Years ago, I was walking in a park with a friend along a path by a stream. The roots had held the path together and on the end dropped off into the stream. There was a place where the dirt had eroded underneath the path and the roots were still holding the top of it together. Well, my foot fell in one of these spots and as fast as, well, gravity, I was turned upside down, hanging from a root and another that had held the path in place by, this, by my ankle. You see, I had faith, 
but the path was not reliable. It's not the amount of faith, it's the object of your faith that matters. Well, in spiritual conversation, and I'll just say in a life conversation, you want to reveal who or what is being trusted in. It could be a thing, it could be a person, but the question is, is it reliable? Is this person trustworthy, both now and in the future? Well, the Bible assures us there is a shield of faith in Christ. You can place your trust in Christ for the first time and then continue to walk or live by faith. So your, your shield that this passage says to now take up is your faith in Christ. That's objective, a decision that you first made to follow Jesus. But then it's also subjective. You live by faith all, at all times and in everything in your life. Galatians 2.20, Paul describes it like this. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There's spiritual cover in living by faith. Faith is a shield in the battles of life. So what does it look like to live by faith? In the companion letter to the, to the Colossian church, Paul expanded on what it meant to live by faith. And I believe that helps us fill in some of the gaps here in the book of Ephesians 6, helps us understand what this use of the word faith means. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, having received him or put faith in him, continue to live your lives in him, rooted, built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See, to live by faith has an agricultural example, being rooted. In Jeremiah 17, explains this metaphor. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. This is what the Lord said, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in the salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, they will be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This idea of being rooted assumes there's a source. And when you are deeply leaning on, trusting in that source, then your life in Christ is secure. Your faith is strong. But there's also an architectural picture in this verse in Colossians chapter 2. It's being built up in him. 1 Corinthians 3.11 talks about Christ as the foundation of our lives. A foundation is both invisible most of the time and essential. Maybe you've seen the movie War Room. Talked about a woman who prayed for someone whose marriage was struggling and encouraged her to do the same. Well, you can make every room in your house a war room, a room of prayer. Moving your prayers from a list of things to a strategy. Building on Christ, having a firm foundation. Well, there's not only an agricultural metaphor being rooted and a, or agricultural being rooted, an architectural one uh, being built up, but there's also an athletic metaphor, and that's being strengthened. Hebrews 12 says to run the race with endurance. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says that an athlete cannot win without keeping the rules. And as in every relationship, 
Trust is built over time. It's an intentional process with attention giving to growth and progress and development. You can't start the race on the day before. It starts months before with training and preparation. So what does this look like? You're saved by a decision of faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. By grace, through faith, not by works. So the Christian life is growing in trust in the trustworthy one. Growing faith in the faithful one. By grace, through faith, not by works. Stated in the negatively, not by works. Stated in the positively, by grace, through faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Relying on Him in a continuing sense, day by day, after that initial decision. So it's not how much faith you have, it's the object of your faith. So I summarize this verse, verse 16 in chapter 6 of Ephesians, like this. Faith shields you when it's rooted, built up, and strengthened in Christ. So why is it so easy to get sidetracked? Well, the movie version of Spiritual Experiences shows doors and windows opening and closing by themselves. Things flying across the room, maybe a strange fog or creepy voices and flashing eyes. Well, the Bible confirms that Satan and demons are intelligent and powerful, sometimes even visible, that sometimes influence over people. But there's different responses to this in our understanding of spiritual warfare. One is to think, well, it must not be real. It's only the stuff that movies are made of. And yet 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says to test the spirits to see if they are from God. Assumes that not every spiritual experience comes from God. And spiritual experiences are real and must be tested. The second response might, might be that if you don't see the things that you attribute to spiritual experiences, then spiritual warfare is not really happening. See, without being visible, this passage and others affirm that your enemy is always attacking. He's mostly unseen. He's seeking opportunities for you to trust in anything except Christ. Paul warned about this in Colossians 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. See, your enemy, Satan, and his demons will do whatever it takes to get your attention, to get your faith away from Christ, and to trust anything else. Most of the time, it's quite effective without being visible. There are many things that we're attracted to. So how do you help faith to grow when it matters, both in your own life and with others? Especially with others in a crisis or loss, faith can go one of two ways. Go away from God or go toward God. And the problem is that it's often less of a logical problem and more of a personal problem. Author Clarissa Mole writes, grief isn't like planning a road trip. You can't map your route in advance. So talk about some practical steps that you can help people grow in their faith, help yourself and others. First is this, from her she writes, recognize pain and how grief hurts. Recognize the pain involved. You know, it's easy to blow it off, maybe encourage people to move on. And often, knowing that you care, not making light of the pain that someone feels, not pretending to understand it, but offering grace and being present often is the best 
gift that you can give. Recognize pain. Second is to accept the timing. The timing of how long grief lasts. It may for many people, I'd say for most people, there's some pain that lasts a lifetime. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that death is the last enemy to be defeated on this earth. So moving on can't just be done on a schedule. It requires patience. So if you're going to be a friend to someone to build their, their faith in a time of loss, you'll need to be patient. Accept the timing. Third is Admit how hard it is to find companions, especially someone who's lost a spouse. You don't just replace the companionship or of a spouse or a child. Job's friends, although they weren't the best comforters, they were committed and they were invested. They stayed with Job and recognized the trouble just by their presence. And so we can do that for others as well recognizing the depth of the pain, accepting the timing, and also admitting that it's hard to find companionship and move past a difficult loss. But the fourth thing is this, adore Jesus together. Take every opportunity to help people see not only the empty tomb, the future that we have in identifying with the resurrected Christ, but also the nail-scarred hand that Jesus understands our pain. He understands our losses and he's been tempted in every way like we have so that he can be with those who are in trouble and in grief. Jesus is a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. So faith is not in your feelings, but in the person of Jesus Christ. You can be his hands and his feet even to someone else, being patient in this journey of faith, confident in the God in whom we trust. God is the one who grows faith, but you can help point the way. So where do you start? What does this now take up look like? Well, one area would be in the Word, in reading the Bible, especially in memorizing the promises of God. I like to call memorized verses mobile truth. Truth you can take with you that's ready at any moment, not only to use and recite in your own mind, but also to encourage others. Another area is in prayer. You might say simply, Father, I trust you for the next 30 minutes. And then the 30 minutes after that. In fact, I wonder what would happen if you paused today and said, Father, I trust you for the next 30 minutes. Ask questions. Ask for wisdom. You may be surprised how God answers that prayer. A third way is keeping a history. Maybe some of you are used to writing a journal or just writing things down because it's a good way that you learn and remember. It's good to write down the things that you're thankful for. Maybe the worries that you can give them to Christ. And as the Bible often says, to remember. To remember the faithfulness of God to build your faith. See, God's priority is your holiness more than your happiness. And this perspective of seeing what God is doing in your life, even in difficult circumstances, can build your friend, build your faith. And fourthly, find a friend. Find a believing friend who will pray for you and pray with you. About anything to refocus your time and your affections away from the troubles of this world and toward Christ. Faith shields you when it's rooted, built up, and strengthened in Christ. When your enemy strikes you, you lift up Jesus. When your enemy strikes your friends, you lift up Jesus. And when your faith needs rooted or build up or strengthened like the shield, you lift up Jesus so that you can stand in Christ. Let's pray and ask God to work this transformation in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are a faithful God Your word tells us the history 
of your pursuing love for your people, even as people ran away from you, even as we have run away from you, Father, you stand ready to forgive. You pursue us with your love. Father, I pray for one who would, for the first time, make a decision of faith. To admit that we've turned away from you, to believe that Jesus came to this earth, died on the cross, a sacrificial death, and rose again to give new and eternal life, and then to commit, commit to follow you, not perfectly, but in the power of your Holy Spirit, relying on you, Father, a decision of faith and a life of faith. Father, I pray for those who are going through difficult times and hardships now, maybe a loss of a loved one or some grief that, that lingers and may last for most of this broken world, this lifetime. Father, I pray for the comfort that you promise. I pray for the strength of their faith by trusting in you and by growing in faith, in your word, in prayer, in the memories of your faithfulness, and by bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Father, I pray that you would grow us in faith so that we can hold up this shield and be protected from the fiery darts of the enemy. We thank you for another day, for your love and care for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our King. To him we will sing In his great mercy he has given us life Now we can be called the children of God Great is the love that the Father has given us He has delivered us He has delivered us Children of God Sing your song and rejoice for the love that he has given us all. Oh, children of God, by the blood of his Son, we have been redeemed and we can be called children of God. Children of God. Father above has proven his love. Now we are free from the judgment that we deserve. So we are called children of God. Great is the love that the Father has given us. He has to Oh, children 
faith that matters is in a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. To be rooted, built up, and strengthened in Christ is to lift him up and stand in Christ. Well, if I can help you in any way to take your first step or your next step of faith, please let me know. We would love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you in your faith journey. A reminder to our church family, we continue praying for our search team and for our next pastor, for our church and congregation, that we would be ready to do what God has prepared next. I want to end with this promise. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. May God bless you this week as you trust in him.